Due to concerns around uh, the COVID-19, we have decided to postpone the 11th a ALC until November. And this month, we organized ALC webinar uh, with our knowledge partner in China, Chong Kong Graduate School of Business. Our webinar will be aired on live throughout the world, simultaneously translated in Korean, English, and Chinese. And live talks will be aired through Joseon.com, ALC YouTube channel and Chinese platform. Before we move on, uh, I would like to first explain the format of today's event. It is going to be a 90-minute session with three, minute, uh, three five minute long keynote speeches and one hour panel discussion. Today's topic is global economic recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. We are now living through the most uncertain moment of our lives. Uh, coronavirus lockdowns push the world into sharp and painful recession. And the depth and speed of the decline will rival that of a Great Depression. Here the question is, will the aftermath uh, be as painful or will this pandemic give us rise to a new era of human development? And how long will it take for the economy to recover its pre-pandemic strength? And before we move on, let me introduce our speakers, followed by, in the order of the event, uh, Zhou Li, Assistant Dean of Chong Kong Graduate School of Business, and Xiang Bing, Founding Dean and Professor of China Business and Globalization at Chong Kong Graduate School of Business, and Robert Barrow, Paul M. Warburg, Professor at Economics at Harvard University, and Dr. John Guangwu, Chairman of the Institute for Global Economics and former Chairman of Financial Services Commission. And now let's begin. Uh, Dr. Zhou Li, the Assistant Dean of Chong Kong Graduate School of Business, will give us the opening remarks. Dean Zhou Li, welcome. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Hello, everyone. Ni hao. On behalf of CKGSB, that is the Chong Kong Graduate School of Business. I would like to thank you all for attending today's first Asian Leadership Conference webinar, which are greatly honored to be co-organizing with Chaoxing Yibo. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Chaoxing Yibo for having invited the CKGSB professors to speak at the Asian Leadership Conference in Seoul for the past eight years and giving us the privilege to co-host this first Asian Leadership Conference online event. CKGSD is a private-owned private business school, was established in Beijing in November 2002. More than half of our faculty members were tenured professors at the top business schools such as Wharton and the Yale School of Management before they joined CKGSD full-time. Three of our professors became the chief strategy officers of a very distinguished companies like Alibaba, and financial services, and JD.com. The school has become the first choice for, many, for management education among many Chinese most influential business leaders, including the founders of companies like Alibaba and Tencent, and the 35 unicorn companies. More than 50% of our 14,000 alumni are at the chairman and the CEO level. Collectively, they lead 25% of China's most valuable brands. In addition to the courses in Chinese, we offer executive education programs in English and other languages. So far, more than 3,000 foreign executives from Fortune 500 companies in Asia, North America, and Europe, as well as many leading companies and startups from, from all major economies have studied at CKGSD. We are going to have our first online course in July in English. More than 30% of our English MBA students are from other countries. We are very pleased to see more and more of them are from Korea. Since mid February this year, as part of our contribution to the fight against COVID 19, CKGSB has organized more than 50 webinars to share the insights from our world class faculty and our business leaders alumni. We start offering bilingual webinars in April, and today is our very first 
time, you know, our very first time organizing a global trilingual webinar in English, Korean, and Chinese. And I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to many of my colleagues at CKGSB and at Chongqing Yibo for their tireless efforts and the great cross-cultural teamwork to make this possible on a very tight schedule. The virus has kept our bodies from traveling, but nothing can stop our minds from sharing our learning. We are privileged today to have three distinguished speakers from the US, China, and Korea. They will provide important insights at a time when the world is looking for answers to the massive challenges and unprecedented opportunities created by the COVID-19 pandemic. I wish you all a pleasant day of learning today and I hope to see you in Seoul for the ALC in November. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Zhou. Uh, we also hope to see you again this November. And next, we will begin our keynote speech session. Uh, Mr. Xiang Bing, the founding dean and professor of China Business and Globalization at the Chongkong Graduate School of Business will give us the first keynote speech. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kim. And uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it is really a privilege and a delight to be here today to share with you my personal views and assessment and the potential consequences of this pandemic. And uh, my views, my analysis of the potential consequences are at several levels. The first is really global level. That's including global governance and international organizations. The second one, the national level. If this whole ongoing unfolding event have a huge consequence of global order, what are the potential competitiveness of each country or nation or regions? You know? Thirdly, is at a company level. And because the time constraint, maybe I should start with uh, the global one. Many of the issues challenge we have today predate the outbreak. Prior to the outbreak, we already had really dysfunctional global governance. One reason for that was the US, the indispensable nation for the global governance system to work has been so reluctant to take on that leadership role. And the potential, this trade conflict between China and US, a rivalry between China and US is not doing a positive contribution. So when US is absent from this global leadership role, when the number one, number two economy, US China, contributed more than 50% of the GDP, global GDP last year, about uh, over 90% of global economic growth last year. When those two economies, when don't see eye to eye with each other, I, I see the great difficulty for a functional global governance. Secondly, for the international organizations, you know, uh, when um, Obama administration, sorry, when Trump ad administration taking a America first approach and has been withdrawing from many of the international organizations. Uh, I think uh, that may be the beginning of end of WTO era, where this coronavirus outbreak that may officially spell the end of this WTO era. I may think we already enter a new era without a WTO. I see these flood of bilateral, trilateral, regional deals emerging. Having emerged, will be emerging in the future. So I think uh, at the national level, the business level, we're gonna see very different landscape as far as trade and investment are concerned. You know. And at the corporate level, I think these restrictions, not only on trade, but also people movement, at least uh, for the coming one year or so, and then maybe capital, you know, will be a challenge for companies. Global companies, 
really need to rethink about the global supply chain issues. They want to not only take advantage of the cost, economy of scale, specialization, but also they want to diversify a little bit. And they have to be prepared for the potential hiccups like this ongoing pandemic in the future. So there are going to be a lot of changes for coming years. Those are my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Xiang, for your informative, insightful speech. And next, Mr. Robert Barrow, Paul M. Warburg, Professor of Economics at Harvard mm -hmm. University, will give us the second keynote speech. Welcome, Professor Barrow. Thank you. I'm glad to be participating. So from the perspective of the U.S. and other uh, rich countries, particularly, uh, we're experiencing uh, an unprecedented, sh sharp, voluntary reduction in GDP, which was engineered in order to try to curtail the uh, pandemic. Uh, this is really an unprecedented uh, situation. But the most important issue is not the current size of the contraction, but rather what will come next in terms of the speed and size of the recovery once places have reopened. I'm actually pretty optimistic on this front. I expect a sharp uh, V-shaped economic recovery in the United States and uh, elsewhere, um, partly because capital is basically in place. It's not a situation where we had uh, destruction of physical or human capital. Uh, I think most of the linkages between firms and uh, their workers and between firms and suppliers uh, will be maintained and I don't think too many firms will end up uh, going out of business, particularly larger ones. Um, there's a very limited empirical history to look at to assess exactly uh, what a V-shaped recovery will be and how probable it is. I've tried to look at the history and if we have a chance later, I can try to talk about that. Um, but that's my best guess about what will follow on the current uh, downturn. There's really no point in the current situation in having massive general uh, policy stimulus, uh, monetary fiscal policy. Uh, normally you do that in order to try to boost GDP. But in fact, we've already determined that we wanted to have this contraction in economic activity in order to fight the uh, spread of the uh, disease. So given that, it really makes no sense uh, in the short run to be offsetting that with general monetary and fiscal uh, stimulus. It's a good idea for central banks such as the Federal Reserve to be keeping financial institutions uh, intact. You don't want a financial crisis to uh, add to the uh, current situation. Uh, and I think for the most part, that's been happening. That's been done satisfactorily. Similarly, you don't want a big problem in housing markets. So those are not the current sorts of problems. I think there's some case to be made for governments to subsidize firms maintaining their workforce, keeping the linkages between firms and workers, and also keeping firms from going out of uh, existence. Uh, so subsidy programs along those lines, of which some of that is in the recent US package, uh, that makes sense. I think it also makes sense to expand social safety net programs. But of course, the United States and many other places have gone way too far. And it's quite incredible how much money is being spent on these programs in the United States. Uh, some of it, like the excessive increase in unemployment insurance, is going to make it more difficult to have a strong recovery because basically uh, workers are being subsidized not to go back to work. Uh, so I'm hoping that that program won't stay in place beyond July, which is the current uh, setting. Uh, basically, I think we should see how the massive fiscal intervention that we've already done in the US works out, not pile on more of that. There's some evidence I've been studying the great influenza pandemic, 1918 to 1920, that public health interventions, so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions of the sort that have been put in place, uh, they clearly work to flatten the curve in the sense of lowering the peak death rates. Uh, that's happening now, and it happened also in 1918, 1919. 
uh, it's much harder to know what the longer term effects of these interventions is in terms of cumulative death from uh, either the flu in 1918 or uh, the coronavirus uh, currently. It's clear from the prior experience that you need more than say four weeks in place for these interventions to be uh, effective in the longer term. Uh, possibly 10 to 12 weeks is sufficient. Um, don't really have the evidence on that from the 1918 uh, experience. Um, I know I don't have much time. Let me try to illustrate a bit about what the trade-off might be in terms of thinking about saving lives versus saving economies. Uh, so I want to give you some uh, illustrative components of this kind of a calculation. Uh, the first thing you need to know is what's called the value of a statistical life. There's a large literature on this, uh, which we can discuss a bit later if there's a time. Uh, a common number used there for the US and for other rich countries is about $10 million per life saved. And I'm gonna take that as a reasonable number. It's actually a pretty large uh, number. Second question is how many lives do you save by having the kinds of interventions that have been put in place over the last few months? Uh, so in the US, uh, for illustrative purposes, we are approaching 100,000 deaths. And I'm gonna think about it as though maybe you can save an additional 100,000. That would be a kind of reasonable magnitude. If you multiply that by $10 million per life, you get an aggregate calculation. What is this all worth? That's $1 trillion. And that's 5% of the US annual GDP. Now it's a lot different if you think you can save 1 million lives, which is the kind of number that's more like the great influenza pandemic 1918. Uh, then it would be worth 10 trillion and that would be a half a year's GDP. So that would be a much bigger uh, deal. Uh, the third thing is how much are you losing in economic activity because of these interventions and shutdowns? Um, I'm gonna take that as though GDP is reduced by 20% at an annual rate. Then it's worth to keep that in place for about three months if what you're saving is 100,000 lives. That's the calculation for the US. And that's about the political calculation that in fact seems to be working out. Because after two to three months, it seems like we're moving to relax the extreme interventions that were put in and things are opening up. Uh, that corresponds to the numbers that I'm uh, uh, presented. And of course we could think about different numbers. I was trying to present a framework. Um, finally, let me make a few points about what I think might be permanent changes coming out of this crisis. Uh, as has already been mentioned, I think there's going to be a permanent reduction in global trade. And I think a general movement toward uh, producing goods more domestically. Uh, in the U.S., that would mean an expansion uh, of manufacturing back toward uh, partly levels that were present uh, in the past. Uh, this could be especially uh, in terms of critical goods, but from a political standpoint, what's a critical good can become quite uh, uh, expansive. I think there is a, a long-term damage to the relationship between the United States and China coming out of this crisis. And that'll be partly involved with thinking about trade uh, and global health and other uh, issues. I think there's been a, a decrease in trust uh, uh, for China coming out particularly of uh, questions about transparency, especially in the early stages of this uh, pandemic. Uh, so I think that's going to be a problem that's going to make it even more difficult than before to have amicable negotiations between the United States and China. Of course, there are other things that are going to be permanent, uh, as is obvious. There's going to be more work at home, uh, more of these Zoom-type internet sessions that have become familiar. I think currency is basically going to disappear, which uh, hadn't been true. Uh, on the other hand, I think that to a large extent, uh, after a couple years, people are going to basically forget about this pandemic. I don't think it's going to be something that in the long run people are going to continually have in mind. That was also true in 1918. Even though the great influenza killed 40 million people roughly worldwide, after a couple years, people basically forgot about it. And I think that that will be true in the current uh, situation. Thank you.
It is really interesting to hear this optimistic viewpoint and several solutions. Thank you, Professor Vera, for sharing your insight and knowledge with us. But we can discuss more about China and U.S. relationship in, during the panel discussion. And next, Dr. John Guang Wu, uh, Chairman of Institute for Global Economics and former Chairman of Financial Services Commission, will give us the last uh, keynote speech. Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. Um, first of all, I'm so very delighted to join this webinar, um, uh, which is uh, the very first occasion uh, hosted, co-hosted by uh, Chosun Ilbo and CK at USB. Now, I'm also uh, very happy to be part of this uh, uh, event, along with the two outstanding scholars representing United States and, and China, uh, respectively. Um, now, as we all know, COVID-19 is making the most devastating economic damage since the Great Depression. Um, not to mention serious human casualties of the last uh, five months. Now, the world is at a crossroads uh, in fighting against the pandemic crisis. On the one hand, we see some encouraging signs, such as gradual easing of lockdown, reopening of economy, and glimmer of hope for the development of vaccine. On the other hand, however, we face increasing challenges and uncertainties, which complicate and undermine our efforts to cope with the economic uh, crisis we face now. I would like to uh, highlight some of these uh, headwinds, challenges, uh, which is also intended uh, to lay a ground for subsequent discussion, uh, because I am also serving as a moderator for uh, uh, this uh, webinar today. Uh, I'm going to highlight four points here. First, uh, the escalating tension between the United States and China is of great concern for all of us. Uh, Professor Barrow has alluded uh, to this already, but we'll certainly follow up uh, uh, through our uh, discussion. But as someone put it, uh, this confrontation uh, is like a great decoupling uh, that's happening. Uh, in the aftermath of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, as you know, the global problem requires global solution. Uh, but international cooperation is not working properly this time around. Sadly, it is going in the opposite direction. The coronavirus outbreak is also a wake-up call for the international community, and especially G2, to rebuild trust and leadership in global affairs. We must join force to avoid confrontation and promote collaboration in fighting against our common threat. This is high time for the United States and China to demonstrate their responsible leadership comparable to the size of their economy and influence. Secondly, for the deteriorating economic prospects, I hope uh, Robert is right in uh, expecting V-shaped uh, recovery uh, down the road. We will come to that point. Uh, but broadly, uh, the, the consensus appears uh, to be uh, further deterioration compared to earlier projections uh, made by IMF and others. Especially this second quarter is likely to record historically low growth and employment. We must act decisively to expedite uh, economic recovery, but at the same time, we need to pay greater attention to building resilient and sustainable uh, economy as well. I very much look forward to having insightful views about economic outlook and policy measures from our speakers today. 
The third is trade-off between containing pandemic and reopening economy. There are growing concerns over the second wave infection around the world these days, when most countries strive to open up economic activities. A typical strategy, exit strategy, calls for slow and phased approaches, but the resumption of business cannot be delayed for too long. It is true that developing vaccine and treatment is essential uh, to provide a critical momentum for turnaround. But in the meantime, we must find a way to strike a balance between the two inevitable conflicts. But last last uh, but not least, reshaping of economic paradigm that is called post-COVID-19 new norm. We, we are moving into uncharted territory as we confront significant changes between before and after pandemic. Regarding the continued trend of deglobalization, let's not forget the virtues of globalization in promoting growth by way of active trade and investment across countries. Deglobalization should not be taken the end of globalization, but rather should be the evolution of globalization. That is to say, we must resist temptation for blind nationalism in the wake of the COVID-19. Our collective wisdom can help shed lights on how the world will look like and what we must do uh, to make the world a better place to live. I'm hoping to discuss these and, uh, and other related issues today uh, in positive and constructive spirit uh, with our prominent speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John, for your insightful speech. You really left the attendees hungry for more. And now this marks the end of the keynote speech session and we will move to the panel discussion. Uh, Dr. Zhang Guangwu will be the moderator for this session. Dr. Zhang, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, uh, the last speaker has a disadvantage of uh, uh, having to repeat some of the, the, uh, the issues that have already <laughs> raised by previous speakers. Um, uh, but I'm happy to, uh, to repeat and pursue, uh, explore further uh, discussion of this. Uh, some of the issues we have already raised uh, uh, to, uh, with the hopes that uh, we can have uh, the most of the, uh, the intelligence and insight uh, from our uh, uh, speakers today. Now, I would like to open up our uh, uh, discussion with uh, G2 decoupling and international, I would say, international disorder. Uh, Bing has already said that this is not the new thing. This uh, uh, international discord has been there because of the, uh, 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 the continuing trade dispute between uh, G2 uh, countries for at least for the last two or three years. Uh, and, uh, and the point here is that because of this COVID-19, uh, there appears to be a, a new round of uh, uh, the, uh, the confrontation between the uh, uh, United States and, uh, and China. Now, my question to you uh, is that, um, uh, how do you take this current situation? Uh, by that I mean, uh, is it that serious as someone put it, like uh, Financial Times, FT, I call it as the beginning of new Cold War, uh, or is uh, exaggerated, more or less uh, politically uh, motivated uh, than, uh, than, than real? So I, I would like to, I'll uh, start with perhaps Bing, would you like to say a few words about uh, how, what your take on the, the current uh, situation? Well, uh, in the past, uh, uh, 
under President George W. Bush, uh, U.S. helped China immensely in fighting against the spread of SARS. And in Obama administration, China, U.S. worked really together to deal with this HA, H1N1, H7N9, and the Ebola outbreak. For this kind of global pandemic, China and the U.S. must work together. For global governance to work, for strengthening international organizations, number one, U.S. may need to return to the leadership role, and U.S. China must work together. Uh, and I said in the past conferences, I don't see a plan B. There's only plan A available. We need to rise above our differences, really work together constructively forward looking. Whatever differences, we need to really dialogue, sit down in what way we can make it better, not pointing fingers at each other. I think this is gonna be so essential for China, for US, for the global community, not only for fighting against this kind of virus, but also for global economy to recover as well, and for shaping the new global order to come. So that's my hope. I, I hope that's the way of moving forward. And then not only the government, but also I think the business, the universities, I think we need to develop talents that are truly global-minded globally responsible. They need to compete, collaborate with compassion, empathy. When we set up the school in 202, we brought the humanities, history, religion, philosophy to the business school. We were the very first business to do that. Today, this become more critical. The compassion, the empathy, it could be so essential. The attitude, as you stressed, it could be so essential. That's the way I see it forward. Thank you. Okay, but, uh, your point was well taken. Uh, Robert, could you, uh, could you uh, add your perspective uh, to this uh, discussion? Uh, perhaps, you, I, I'm sure we all agree that, uh, uh, you know, uh, for speedy recovery, economic recovery, and uh, speedy uh, containment of a virus, we all need uh, to work together. But uh, to, to relieve uh, this uh, uh, tension between two uh, countries, what, what needs to be done? Right? What, what sort of uh, uh, you know, ideas or steps that we uh, must, uh, that counterparts uh, must consider in, in relief of this tension? Well, let me try to provide some of my perspectives on that. China-U.S. relationship in particular. I should say first that I've been a great fan of China for some time, particularly in terms of the great achievement of economic growth since the end of the 1970s and the opening up to markets and basically to capitalism. And in the recent trade war, I uh, thought the United States was uh, basically in the wrong. And I thought China was being more constructive in its thinking, even though there were issues about technology transfer and such that were uh, pertinent. But given the success that China's had, I was really quite disappointed with their uh, reaction early on with regard to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. It seems like there was a lot of lack of transparency, which I think uh, produced a lot of costs. I think it produced a lot of costs uh, uh, throughout the world. But even if that's correct, and there's some kind of guilt there, I think today, in thinking about going forward, there's really no way to do anything about that. Uh, even if it's true that uh, China did not uh, behave optimally, particularly in the early stages of this uh, pandemic, uh, the situation I'm reminded of is the end of World War I uh, and the Versailles Treaty in terms of the treatment of uh, Germany. And some people thought it was really important to punish Germany because they viewed Germany as being guilty of having uh, 
initiated the war. And there was a lot of pressure to put the uh, unreasonable reparations uh, on Germany. And it worked out terribly. Uh, it was not a good idea at all. And many people believe that that action eventually led to World War II. And then I think it was better after World War II where uh, we didn't have that approach. The approach there was not to so much look at who was at fault, including Germany again, uh, but rather to start from where you were and go forward in a mutually productive manner. And that's what I think is the best thing to do with respect to this G2, but US and China. I think it's best to forget about who was guilty or not and to start from where we are and try to work together to accomplish things in terms of uh, global trade and uh, international relationships and working together in terms of health related uh, global issues. So that's what I think uh, on these matters. Thank you, Robert. I hope uh, uh, two leaders of, uh, of G2 uh, listen carefully to what uh, you said just before uh, and try to find a way out of this uh, uh, very costly uh, dispute, tension, um, and we, we have to uh, move forward uh, for mutual reconciliation and more productive uh, resolution. Uh, Bing, would you like to add? Uh, uh... Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, the strategic dialogue mechanism in Obama administration, I think, be very, very valuable. So whatever differences, disparity you have, it's very important to sit down to talk about details. Can we do better for each other? That's very important. Always future-oriented, always mm. constructive, always try to reduce the differences. I like that mechanism. That's very essential. All right. Thank Is you. there any possibility that um, uh, some of the international organizations uh, work as a sort of uh, uh, mediator uh, to help narrow the difference between two uh, G2? For example, uh, during 2008 global financial crisis, as you know, uh, G20 framework uh, worked very well uh, to facilitate uh, international efforts to overcome uh, uh, crisis at a time. Now, that is not working very well at the moment, but uh, is there any way to uh, uh, sort of resharpen uh, the mandate of uh, uh, you know, international organization to, uh, to, uh, to help ease the tension? Any thought? You know, the point that the instrumental role in dealing with 2008 global financial crisis, uh, one of the reason for that was U.S. and China could see eye to eye to with each other. You know, it was valuable. It was maybe indispensable. I think for today's situation for economic recovery after the, the pandemic, it's going to be equally valuable, equally valuable, maybe more valuable for international organizations because we need a global solution, as you mentioned, you know, only international organization can do that. They can go beyond the nationalism, the populism, the national interest, better than any other individual country. So this is very important. Thank you. Robert. Oh, the, the current US administration has intense hostility toward international organizations, sure. which now has been extended also to the world health organization. And I can't see, at least in the current political environment, which may not go on for too much longer, I guess, uh, working through international organizations as a kind of mediator uh, instrument to improve things at the G2 level. I think it's more hopeful in terms of uh, bilateral uh, discussions, US and China, I think that was also true in the trade negotiations, uh, you know, some months back. I think that that was uh, proceeding to some extent uh, in terms of U.S. and China bilaterally, uh, rather than again within the context of international organizations. Mm. 
Right. Um, yeah, given that uh, U.S. Uh, administration has no great respect for multilateralism at the moment, uh, certainly uh, Rob uh, has, uh, has a good point. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think some form of a bilateral uh, and multilateral approach to, uh, uh, to help uh, uh, ease uh, this tension. Uh, whatever it takes uh, will be very much needed. Otherwise, uh, many uh, think that uh, this uh, confrontation uh, may last uh, uh, through generations, which is very detrimental, uh, not only to, uh, uh, to countries, but also the entire uh, global community. So uh, we are hoping that uh, uh, very um, constructive dialogue could uh, start uh, soon uh, as we uh, face a uh, deepening uh, uh, crisis uh, down the road. Okay. Yeah, with that, um, uh, so I would like to move on to uh, the economic outlook. Uh, I'm very anxious to hear about uh, uh, Robert's rather optimistic view. Uh, I hope you're right uh, because uh, uh, no, certainly that would be a good news. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, skepticism about the V-shape or any uh, strong rebound within a short period of time because the, uh, the kind of damage that has been inflicted uh, is not something that can be easily cured, uh, especially with you know, uh, the huge uh, impact on the, uh, uh, in the area of uh, employment, and not to mention uh, uh, disruptions in global supply chains, uh, all, all those issues. Uh, uh, you know. So uh, would you elaborate uh, on your contention that uh, we can rely on V-shaped uh, recovery? I think if you, if you uh, make a strong uh, case for this, uh, that would be good news for stock market, right? <laughs> You know, uh, I'm very empirically oriented. So my first instinct is to look uh, for history to try to learn uh, about these kinds of recoveries. But I don't think you can find very much. Uh, and I don't think it's very instructive to look, for example, at recent uh, recessions like the 2008, 2009, uh, which was related to uh, financial markets, housing markets, and uh, involved uh, a much more gradual kind of uh, recovery. It also was not as extreme a, a downturn. I think the current situation is very different, but I'm looking at it as kind of a conceptual, theoretical way. And I think uh, as long as the uh, current downturn doesn't go on for too long, we really haven't destroyed much, most of the things that are in place that look like capital. Uh, that's obvious for physical capital, uh, human capital in the sense of education. Um, I don't think we would have destroyed a lot of linkages between firms and suppliers uh, if this doesn't go on too long and similarly between firms and workers. So that's why it makes sense to me that if the shutdown is terminated and we're reopening, that you could get back very quickly to the levels of economic activity that you were at previously. So I've tried to look at history and what do I find for the closest uh, parallels to the current situation? So I'll tell you what I came up with. I don't know if you're gonna agree that it's parallel or not, but um, the biggest recoveries that look like that uh, in terms of the world record are actually after major wartime uh, contractions of economic activity in countries where you didn't have a tremendous amount of physical destruction. So uh, in World War II, you had a number of countries that were occupied by Germany. Uh, in particular, you have France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And in 1944, they're liberated from German occupation. And if you look at the recoveries after that, 1944 to 46, the uh, average increases in gross domestic product over two years are between 40 and 50% for those countries. And I think that has something of an 
analog to the current situation. You basically had this shutdown, but you didn't destroy a lot of stuff that looks like capital. And then you open things up. And even though in those circumstances, you had the occupation for about four years, you had an extremely rapid uh, recovery. And that's the best insight I've come up with. I know it's not something that looks so intimately connected to the current situation. That's why it's very hard to think about history in this context. Uh, I haven't found better analogs in looking at uh, the history of many countries over many years. Uh, it really is a new situation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bing, would you like to uh, yeah. say anything? I, I hope uh, it will be V-shaped. It will be good for everyone. But uh, I, I have uh, some serious concerns. Uh, number one is the U.S.-China relation we talked about already. And then uh, if uh, China-U.S. relation deteriorates, deteriorates, and uh, that could be really bad for everyone, for global economy. And uh, secondly, you know, there could be a strong pushback against globalization. So the era we had, and we probably not gonna have anything like that for coming decade, you know. So that will, you know, impede the free flow of goods, investment, and the people. And then so, those, so the, we have a new paradigm we made, you know. So, uh, and, and then relating to that at a national level, you see some of the remarks by French President Macron and uh, Mr. Modi, Prime Minister of India. Uh, many, some of the key countries want to emphasize on economic self-reliance. That's going to be bad for global trade. That's not going to be good news for countries that are really export dependent, you know. And, and uh, that will increase the cost of living for many rich countries, you know. And, and then that will take away many opportunities for us to enjoy economy of scale and specialization. So uh, there's there going to be some really bad news out there, you know. And then the companies, for many reasons, for cost, for diversification, for this, uh, you know, this uh, preparation for hiccups or disruption like the coronavirus. So there's going to be a lot of a readjustment, you know. So it, it's, it's going to be a different type of system will be operating. And for Chinese companies, uh, I think uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to compete in many sectors that will be classified as a strategic by some countries, by uh, national security related. You know, I mean, as you said, those definition can be very expensive. They can cover many sectors, you know, even e-bus is included in national security, you know. Yeah. So uh, this will give a lot of new grounds uh, for those politicians. They would like to promote the protectionism. They're gonna have a popular support to make things even worse. They're gonna have a political will to do that. So that's some of the potential negative things I see for a few years to come, maybe a decade to come. And there's gonna be no possibility of WTO for decades to come. And then, then so I see the, the importance of regional trading blocks. You know, you see this uh, a new NAFTA, you see the new deal between Japan and EU. I would like to see a new deal between China, Korea, Japan, maybe ASEAN countries. So the regional bilateral, trilateral regional deals will be the way forward for coming decade, I think. You know. So those are my- uh, can, I, can I respond to that? No, of course, go ahead, yeah. You know, I'm broadly very sympathetic to the pro-global trade arguments that you made. But I think mostly what's at stake here is something contributing to long-run economic growth on the order of maybe half a percent per year, like is the growth rate in the U.S. going to be 2.5 versus 3 percent per year, which I think was the, what was at stake when we were talking about the trade war uh, some months back. But here what we're talking about is a rebound from a contraction where GDP uh, at an annual rate is down by something like 20%. And the rebound there is mostly about getting things reopened and back operating back in place. And I don't think that the global trade contraction, even though that will be serious in the long term, is going to have too much to do with this uh, potential V-shaped recovery. That's why I think that that's still going to be in place. 
Uh, I mean, the other question in terms of recovery is whether the disease is going to go away or not, or whether we're going to have a second wave. Um, now, in the great influenza, you did have a second wave, which was much worse than the first wave. Uh, so after the spring of 1918, you had this second wave from September to February 1919, which was by far the worst. But that's not the usual experience. Um, the usual experience is more about, uh, as I understand it, about viruses disappearing or mutating. Uh, you have like SARS basically uh, going away. Uh, you have seasonal flu, which goes away every, season, every uh, uh, year uh, in, in a seasonal pattern. I don't think this is all that well understood, but the business of the second wave of disease, even though that was true in 1918, 1919, I think that's not the typical uh, pattern in history. Yeah, I um, um, appreciate Can I your- Can one more remark on this one? Sorry. Okay, all right, I, go ahead. Yeah, thank this, you. This Sorry to exactly interrupt. the way I we think, should uh, uh, operate. The pushback against the globalization, not because globalization has done no good. It's because in China, US, there's maybe a possibility too much capitalism. So the, the income was in, inequality. Uh, getting out of hand and diminishing social mobility. So, you know, you can scapegoat the globalization for that. So if the income was inequality, diminishes social mobility, not mitigate effectively, you don't have a popular support for globalization. And accordingly, the politicians, any democracy will have difficulty to promote globalization. So this coronavirus is really not the root cause of that. <laughs> you know, so if we don't have the fundamental problem resolved, uh, we're, we're gonna have the whole thing, the nationalism, the populism coming back the strong way. We don't have the kind of globalization, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 to come back the way we want, like to have. Yes. Okay, all right. I think that point, uh, and being or, uh, earlier you mentioned also, uh, uh, the, the trouble we have with the international governance and the structural impediments to uh, uh, to promote uh, growth more actively. That I'm I'm with you. That's that's an important uh, change uh, from before. Now, Korea. If I share with you uh, the experience we had in Korea, we have gone through before this uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, at least two major uh, economic crises. There was uh, one was uh, part of uh, Asian uh, financial crisis that is 1997 to eight, uh, and the more recent one was the global uh, financial crisis of 2008. In those cases, Korea was very successful in rebounding from um, the shock. Uh, and uh, one of the, the fastest recovering uh, countries uh, at that time. Now, what's the difference then uh, from those experience and, and this one? If, if I add a couple of caveats to, uh, uh, to the hope uh, for V-shaped uh, recovery. So the first is, uh, as, as uh, Robert uh, and you have already mentioned, uh, those two previous crises were not inflicted by virus. It's a different kind of uh, our source of uh, crisis as a, as a pandemic. And on, until, until you have a good control of this by way of developing uh, vaccine or treatment, the resumption of normal economic, economic activities will be rather uh, difficult. So that's, that's one caveat we we have to deal with. The other one has to do with China. Now, thanks to China's very vibrant economy during the period, period of uh, two previous uh, economic crises, that is uh, during 2008 or uh, late uh, 1997 or eight, those were the times when China uh, showed very uh, impressive growth period, which was uh, a, as a good sort of uh, uh, had a, a good externality to uh, to Korea's uh, recovery uh, and was benefited in, in a way. But this time, 
not just Korea, but around the world, since China uh, plays a, such an important role in the global economy. Now, in recent years, we have seen gradual decline in the, uh, in the growth of performance in China and structural uh, bottlenecks, uh, problems uh, China uh, faces these days. So these are the kind of uh, issues that we need to uh, uh, keep in mind when we project a global uh, recovery on the road. Mm. But, but still, I'm hoping for V-shaped uh, recovery. No uh, can I make a remark on this one? I think sure. no doubt Korean did well for this, uh, to, for dealing with the two crises. But uh, there's a regime change here. For the past 40 years, two pillars of global economy, uh, maybe more. One is Miss Thatcher neoliberalism, starting in 1978, followed by 1979 China by Deng Xiaoping's opening up reform policy, uh, President Reagan as well. So China, US may have embraced neoliberalism better than any other country globally. The second pillar was the globalization, greatest globalization era in human history. So, and the rise of China. So I think uh, uh, Korea as an export led economy have benefited substantively from this regime. But my, I think the regime will be changed fundamentally. We see the limit of neoliberalism in China and in the US. China, US may need to search for new models. And there's gonna be, there could be a possibility imbalance of development models, like too much neoliberalism in China, US, uh, too much uh, state uh, social democracy in Europe. So there's imbalance across regions. So that, that could be a problem. Okay, so there could be a new regime, even without the coronavirus. I think we're, we're already in the process searching for a new one. Thank you, yes. Uh, Robert? Yeah. Well, maybe I could make a few comments about uh, South Korea. Uh, I've been critical for a few years about the policy being uh, carried out by the government in uh, Korea under this uh, slogan, income-led growth which has been in place for uh, a few years. And I think it represented a movement of uh, Korea away from kind of a market capitalism orientation and uh, export led economy and toward more of a populism that was uh, focused on things like uh, income redistribution and higher taxes on companies and on wealthy individuals. I thought that had already led to a situation where Korea's growth rate had gone down quite substantially. And it looked like that might be permanent uh, before the coronavirus uh, issue. Uh, it looked like uh, Korea was no longer gonna be the growth engine that it had been for so long. Um, so I don't know where the status of that is from a political standpoint, uh, whether the coronavirus has in fact strengthened this populism move that was uh, already uh, moving in place in, in, in Korea. And it's also true going forward, given its dependence on uh, exports, that uh, Korea may be particularly harmed by uh, uh, contractions related to, to global trade. I mean, some places like Vietnam, I would expect to benefit by uh, substituting, particularly for China, in terms of uh, international supply chains. But I don't know that that's going to apply to Korea in the same uh, way. Mm. Uh, well, I, I think I have to respond to Bob's, Robert's uh, comment on, on, on South Korea. Um, first, I would like to say that uh, certainly your criticism of uh, uh, government uh, uh, policy, uh, often referred to as income-led growth, uh, and you have a point there, and uh, I think uh, we have to make uh, uh, necessary adjustment to uh, uh, to the existing uh, policy stance uh, in coping with uh, uh, this uh, uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. Uh, but as of now, the, it is clear that the government feels strongly that government has to play a bigger role uh, in 
uh, revitalizing the economy, uh, you know, to reflect on the, the major changes that we uh, expect to have uh, throughout this uh, uh, pandemic uh, period. So I, I think government is looking uh, forward, taking forward-looking uh, postures. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, to reflect on your uh, your very constructive comments, I think some, I hope, some adjustment uh, to be made so that we can, you know, uh, energize private sector uh, companies as a, as a new engine for uh, growth uh, so that we can, Korea can resume its uh, 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 strong uh, performance, uh, growth performance uh, down the road. Export-led the economy side, of course, uh, you know, we, we, it's uh, one of the, the drawback of our uh, economic structure. Our, uh, you know, we need to expand uh, a domestic consumption side more so that we have a, a better balance uh, between uh, uh, export and uh, domestic uh, uh, consumption. Now, there again, uh, this is a very difficult period. Try to, uh, uh, you know, the, the economy needs a lot of support, especially in those areas like uh, small and medium sized companies and self employed uh, uh, businesses are heavily uh, affected by the crisis. So, uh, uh, government is trying to shore up. Uh, their, uh, you know, survivability um, so that uh, they can be part of, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of uh, uh, this uh, uh, more balanced, uh, creating more balanced uh, structure uh, at home. Uh, now, uh, by the way, this uh, small and medium companies and, and uh, uh, self-employed uh, business account for uh, more than 80% of the entire workforce in, in Korea. So uh, they, they need to uh, be also uh, uh, protected, but at the same time to promote uh, the strong leadership of uh, large corporations uh, to be competitive in the, in the global market. Uh, so the you know, government is trying to achieve dual objectives along, along that line. Um, yeah. I offer a uh, remark on this one. No, sorry. Okay. Actually, something we did in the past seven years uh, was uh, attempt to try to contribute to mitigate some of the problem faced, uh, you know, being faced by many countries. The idea was called economic disruption. We want to help young people have a possibility when they become a unicorn company. If you compare China, Japan, Japan is really noted for its excellence in innovations. But Japan didn't do well for the past three decades in terms of generating new companies, new billionaires. And you see, every five, 10 years, there's a sea change in the list of richest people in China, and a new company emerging. That's really unique. You compare with China, India, roughly similar in population size. You don't see much change in list of richest people in India, okay? So if the economies do not give young people hope, you can see a flood of problem you see in France, in Chile, even as a democracy, okay? So to give young people hope, always new generation of uh, companies, uh, newly rich, that are socially responsible is a way forward. I think the schools, okay. the business sector have much to contribute, better than just government, you know, income, <laughs> that growth model. You know, okay. that's one thing. Sorry. Okay, yeah. great. I, I, you know, that, that point was very well taken. Before we move on to uh, next uh, uh, topic, uh, I would like to ask uh, Bing uh, uh, one thing about uh, your important uh, gathering in Beijing tomorrow. This uh, National People's uh, Congress uh, meeting uh, convening tomorrow, right? It has been delayed for some time, but yeah. finally is taking place. And uh, there's uh, an expectation that uh, Beijing authorities may come up with a more aggressive stimulus package. Uh, could we expect something like that? Or is it 
Well, you know, this uh, whole reconfiguration, global uh, governance, economic order is still in process. And, and I, I think uh, uh, China probably in better shape uh, because even there's a strong pushback against globalization. Uh, China has a large size GDP in a population domestic market, a relatively complete supply chain. No country enjoy a complete supply chain. I mean, for many sectors, you know. And, and uh, so China might do well in that regard. I'm very positive in the sense that the, the coming, uh, the conference will focus on, uh, you know, containing the spread of this virus and get the economy back to work. And, and also, you know, uh, to improve the international environment of China. I think mm. this is gonna be the three key issues to be focused upon. Yes, that's my two cents. Okay, but, but isn't it also true that uh, uh, the investment community around the world feels uh, uh, strongly that uh, Chinese, Chinese authorities have rather limited policy measures at this time because of uh, very substantial uh, national debt and also uh, uh, the uh, uh, compared to other uh, major economies, inflation is relatively high. So what that means is that the scope for additional monetary and the fiscal expansion uh, is rather narrow. Uh, is oh, that I don't agree with that. that. You know, China has so many instruments to play with. For example, we have about 30 sectors remain to be deregulated. The neoliberalism, I mean, Thatcher has run its course in the U.S., a spent force, because in the U.S., virtually each, every sector is deregulated. But in China, we have so many. You know, we, we can just keep on growing the economy by deregulations, deregulations. And China has been underinvested in terms of social security program. Our educational system only covers ninth grade. We don't have universal health care. We don't have universal pension system. You know, I mean, so we, we have a lot to catch up. Just the deregulation. So neoliberalism in China has a lot of miles left. We can grow the economy by new round of deregulations. So aren't, aren't there issues in China in terms of having overbuilt uh, certain types of uh, capital like uh, commercial real estate and uh, apartment buildings and trying to there, there could be don't could. work properly and things like that yeah there could be but uh, you know if the control economy we can deregulate oil and gas telecom financial services education media sports you know, we, we have so many sectors <laughs> meant to be deregulated. That's a key element of Deng Xiaoping's reform policy. So we have yeah. many reservoirs. We can leave the game. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's so it's okay. China will be all right. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope you're right on that too. Mm. Okay. All right. Shall we move on to uh, the third out of four uh, sort of group of issues that we would like to. Uh, uh, discuss that has to do with the uh, the trade-off uh, between contain containing pandemic and reopening economy. Uh, actually, uh, Professor Barrow has uh, has some uh, comment on that uh, already. Uh, but I, I think there is a, this is a critical dilemma uh, we face uh, in our recovery efforts because of the uh, you know as we all uh, uh, recognize. Um, the possibility of a second wave uh, uh, infection. Uh, no country is immune to this. China has uh, a problem. We, even Korea has uh, some of these uh, this issues. And the latest hot spot around the world is Brazil. Now is they are becoming a country that see huge increase in uh, new uh, infections uh, and death. So um, on the one hand, we really try to uh, reactivate our economy, but certainly there is a clear uh, hurdle uh, in moving along the line because uh, it could uh, again jeopardize uh, the, uh, the speedy uh, the opening of, uh, of the economy. So 
striking a balance between these two is, uh, I don't think it's a science, more of uh, art, I think, on, on the part of policymaker. There's uh, uh, no clear direction we can sort of uh, uh, give to uh, policymakers. But uh, given uh, your extensive experience and uh, the experience we had uh, uh, long before, uh, Robert, uh, do you, you, would you like to say a, to uh, something to uh, uh, government authorities hesitating or debating uh, when to open and how to open the economy uh, by reducing the risk of uh, uh, new infections uh, to a minimum? Is there any, any way or guidelines you would like to share with us? You know, I think this is the first time that we've had this uh, wide scale implementation of these public health interventions that look like basically curtailing business and related to that having this sharp contraction of the gross domestic product. Um, this really was not put into place, um, even in the great influenza pandemic, which was much more serious as a medical problem. Uh, you had things like school closings then and prohibitions on public gatherings, but you didn't have this mass uh, curtailment of business, which is uh, something different here. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong, but I, I'm saying it's, it's, it's something new. And in terms of the reasonable trade-off, we've about gotten to the limit uh, in the U.S. and other places in terms of what seems to make sense in this trade-off between uh, um, reduced loss of life versus reduced uh, economy. And that's why, again, I think there's this uh, movement towards uh, opening up pretty uh, uh, broadly. And I think that makes sense. Uh, again, uh, I said a little bit about a potential second wave and I really have no great way to predict that. Uh, it's definitely a possibility, but it's not inevitable. And the vaccine track seems to be quite promising and on a much uh, more rapid uh, time scale than is normal. Um, so I think that can be positive. In terms of what you said about Brazil, I might note that it was very strongly true in the great influenza pandemic, 1918 to 20, that it was the poorest countries that had the worst outcomes by far. And uh, the worst situation was in India, which contributed about 40% of the world's deaths in that uh, incident. And it was worse in Africa uh, than most other places, and also bad in some parts of particularly Central America. But I think that's also likely to be true in the current situation. Uh, eventually, it'll be mostly the uh, poorer countries that will experience the most uh, Death, the highest death rates. I think that that will, will be also a characteristic of the situation. Well, all right. Uh, Bing, would you uh, like to uh, anything about this? Because China is also. Uh, but I have uh, uh, some concerns. My concerns about certain national economies where uh, they depend heavily on international tourism education mm. and, um, and then, then this could be like if go the, the whole this pandemic uh, will go on for another year that's going to be a huge damage mm. on the economy for many medium sized small size companies many of them would have difficulty surviving if whole thing goes on for another three or six months working capital wise mm. i mean their business model is good everything's good but 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 it could be a serious challenge for many, many business if this whole thing goes on for another three or six months. So that's my concern, very serious concern. Yeah, thank you. I don't have an estimate like, uh, you know, how this whole thing, I cannot advise government in terms of what to do. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Well, I think that's partly why there's so much pressure after about uh, up to three months of closure. Yes. Coming up. Because as you say, the longer you're doing it, the more you're creating permanent damage. And mm, yeah. I think there's a lot of businesses that can operate in a reasonably safe manner, but you're right. Certain sectors are gonna be uh, 
more in a permanent down situation, particularly mm -hmm. things to uh, tourism travel. Um, so it's, uh, it's still out there as to when we'll be able to open up with regard to those sectors. Mm. Okay, I, I would like to leave uh, uh, this uh, third category of uh, discussion and move to uh, the last uh, part. That has to do with, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, earlier intervention, uh, kind of what, what sort of major changes do you expect uh, between before and after? Although we, we can also uh, say something about these changes could be permanent, or some changes that we are talking about here uh, could prove uh, rather temporary because of uh, much, uh, you know, when, when coronavirus becomes under control, uh, things could back to uh, the original uh, you know, uh, situation. So could you say uh, something about uh, what, the, the major structural fundamental changes that you see in the so-called the new normal, I don't know whether that is good expression uh, uh, for this, but uh, uh, you know, obviously certain industrial uh, you know, areas uh, may, may face uh, fundamental changes uh, and very uh, damage could be uh, uh, very permanent. Uh, whereas some others uh, are quite in quite different uh, uh, situations. So, would you would you say something along that line? Robert, you want to start first? Okay. <laughs> um, I think most of the impact is going to be temporary. And as I mentioned before, I think if you look a year or two down the road if there's not a resurgence of disease, then I think people are mostly gonna forget about it. Even though now we're so preoccupied with this ongoing pandemic that there's almost nothing else to think about. I think that that's mostly gonna be a temporary uh, situation. We've talked about some changes in the economic structure that are likely to be more permanent. Um, some of these are things that were already evolving in terms of an increased tendency to work at home and to rely more on the internet, uh, the kinds of interactions that we're having uh, uh, today. Uh, I must say in terms of my own lecturing at Harvard, I don't find this kind of uh, internet inter relationship with students as a good substitute for being in a classroom with somebody. I don't think it really is that good a substitute. So I'm hoping that that will be a temporary change in regard to the teaching structure. We talk a lot about the longer run changes relating to global trade. And I agree that that's gonna be negative. And to some extent it's reinforcing what was already in place in terms of uh, protectionist tendencies. Um, some of it coming from the United States, which has more traditionally been uh, a leader in terms of promoting free trade, and that's not so true uh, uh, these days. So I think there's gonna be some permanent uh, reduction in the extent of global trade, and I think that's gonna make people worse off in terms of standard of living. Uh, but that's not in terms of this massive short run contraction that we're currently experiencing. I think that's basically something different from the kind of longer run productivity effects related to free trade. Uh, I think those things are important, but they're not the same uh, thing. All right, thank you, Bing. Would you like to add well, to the, uh, the major changes? Some temporary, at, some permanent. At a geopolitical level, uh, I was hoping uh, with uh, the coronavirus, uh, China, US can really rise above our differences really work together, not only by the two, but also with the global community to fight this common virus, okay, and get the economy recovered. I think this is a beautiful opportunity here, okay, to put aside our differences. I still hope this could be the way forward, you know. So this, and secondly, I would like to see China, US really working together to strengthen the international organization, in particular, not only the WHO, but the G20, 
because that's so far the only effective global mechanism to make sure the global coordination to promote the global economic recovery. We don't have any other better mechanism. Yet. It was truly good in t for the 2008 global financial crisis. Why we cannot go back, back you know, to improve the work? So this is, uh, this is my, 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 my hope. And at, at a national level, I want to see uh, less protectionism. I still a believer in free trade. But in order to achieve that, I think, number one, there need to be a coordination, a balance of development models. Neoliberalism in China and the US uh, state, well, you know, the China also has some elements of capitalism. The social democ democracy in Europe, there could be some balance, you know, between, uh, among those, those nations. Uh, secondly, you need to give a young people a hope. I hope the disruption program to be in place, emphasized by government. So young people always have a chance doing better moving upward, you know. So th this could be uh, essential for, for generating popular support for new era of globalization. So politicians will have a mandate to promote that, you know. Others will be pointing fingers at each other, escaping gold, you know. So over in that, uh, you know, the cycle, okay. And thirdly, I think we need to go beyond the government. Government will pay play important role, but business, universities, NGOs, international organization. It's about time we really emphasize on global perspective and global responsibilities. It's about time for us to bring really positive, beautiful elements of humanity to emphasize on compassion and empathy, not only economics, <laughs> but also compassion, empathy. That could be so essential for the future of humanity. If we don't work act together, I think, you know, we're going to be in plan B. That would be so much worse than plan A. To me, it's always plan A. That's my two cents. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good point. So can uh, I say... Uh, sure, Robert, yes. Okay. About the coronavirus pandemic and this uh, cooperation thing. Uh, some aspects of it are very natural for cooperation. Uh, if you think about developing vaccines and treatments, which are obvious public goods, uh, that's an easy area to have uh, cooperation. You can get into trouble, however, uh, when there's a vaccine that's discovered and you're trying to allocate the supplies if they're limited, that'll be much harder to cooperate with. And similarly, if you think of other kinds of supplies, even masks, um, there can be uh, competition there rather than cooperation. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing that the U.S. doesn't know how to make any masks, uh, for example. Um, but I think the coronavirus situation cuts two ways in terms of whether or not it promotes uh, cooperation or something more like a, a competition that would not be so healthy. Okay, all right. Um, I, I would like to make one comment on uh, Robert's uh, point um, earlier. Uh, I am pretty much with you uh, on, on your uh, uh, saying that uh, this uh, online uh, teaching education is not a good substitute uh, for <laughs> real uh, class. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very much with you uh, because uh, now, I'm thinking of uh, the famous phrase by uh, Jack Welch, a uh, legendary CEO. He once said uh, something like this, you cannot become a true global leader only through internet or telephone. You need to have a real interaction with, uh, with good people. Uh, I, I think this, uh, that has a point. Uh, I think, uh, uh, it's great to have a webinar like this uh, to uh, utilize the available technology. Given the situation, I, it's great uh, to have this. But I'm hoping that uh, at some future occasion, I'd like to see both uh, in, in real form rather than just uh, over internet, because that that's uh, that's a different, uh, right? Uh, it's, uh, uh, you 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 have more close networking or this feeling about uh, 
uh, you know, the, what, what others, you know, think about the kind of issues. Uh, so I, I think this real interaction is, uh, 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 is very important. I'm not saying that uh, the webinar is, uh, uh, is uh, less effective. I, I'm just great, you know, uh, channel through which we can uh, uh, discuss, exchange our views uh, under this tough uh, uh, situation. I'm very grateful for, for, for this, but uh, you know, especially for uh, teaching. Um, I think those uh, students should learn uh, from uh, interacting with uh, uh, one another, each other, uh, not just uh, uh, you know, learning from, uh, from uh, internet. Because uh, the, the story that I gather from uh, people uh, in the Silicon Valley, they are mostly now uh, uh, work from home, right? Uh, right. And uh, they feel that they seem to lose a sense of uh, uh, innovation or creativity by just sitting alone because uh, they, they, you know, they, they should uh, nurture each other uh, for more uh, productive thinking uh, through our, you know, uh, real context. So that's what they seem to be uh, saying. So hopefully, uh, yeah, so ho to, hmm. I mean, Harvard is having this debate now about whether it will be able to have in-person classes in September or not. You know, some students argue that uh, the whole point of going to Harvard was to have in-person relationships with uh, professors and fellow students, and they you should just postpone the whole semester if you can't have in-person interaction. Oh, so right. oh, it's certainly a debate. From our experience, like uh, most of our students are chairman CEOs, they learn from these faculty members, but also learn, may learn more from their peers. And yes. not only in class, but also after class, drinking together, going out activity together. So that's going to be essential. You don't get that from internet, you know, especially right. at the chairman CEO level. But Jack Ma is alone, you know, like for his level of uh, seniority, learning from each other is very important, it appears. Great. Uh, we have uh, two minutes to go. Uh, perhaps one minute each. Uh, comment on what industry do you think will thrive in the, uh, the new era of uh, uh, post-COVID-19? Uh, uh, just a uh, uh, guess, prediction, but uh, uh, relatively speaking, some some industries will have a uh, hard time. And maybe uh, the downturn, uh, irreversible or downturn. Some others could come back uh, very easily. So, uh, what are the uh, the promising areas? Uh, you know, for business purpose and also for those your students uh, who plan for their career, where, where they, they should find uh, growing opportunities down the road. You know, you know. Uh, the, the, what kind of areas they need to emphasize in further promoting uh, uh, economic growth. You know which businesses have done relatively well in the current crisis mm. and which industries have done the worst. Some that have done the best are places that can function uh, even when there's a shutdown. And you can do online shopping. Uh, so Walmart is doing pretty well and Amazon. But that is temporary. That, that's like the question is, is this going to be a permanent or a temporary situation? So I don't think those benefits are going to continue so much. Um, we already mentioned concern about things related to tourism and travel, and that might be more of a persistent uh, negative kind of uh, a sector going forward. Okay, thank you. Bing, any, any final comment on this? Well, I, I think uh, uh, for the future, not only the Amazon.com type of companies uh, or, or uh, uh, you know, Alibaba, DAD.com type of companies will, will benefit from this, uh, but, but, but also this uh, I think in the future, it may be more focused on well-being and healthcare, and then 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 the GDP may be less emphasized. You know, so some of those sectors will benefit. From Chinese company point of view, you know, the Chinese company really good at what I call 
non-mainstream sectors like uh, ties, lighters, socks, sewing machines, the Chinese <laughs> company will continue to do well. I mean, we have been playing a domestic help role for U.S. economy. China's economic threat to the U.S. is greatly exaggerated. You know, I mean, we only got one company far away that are competing in the mainstream sector. Okay, and, but they got nailed by national security grounds. You know, we are domestic helper for the U.S. You know, and then the low value added. So those sector Chinese company will continue to do well because there's no ideology constraint, socks, whatever. You know, so the Chinese company will do well. But for the for the mainstream sector, is represented by Huawei. And because of new protectionism, because this relation between China and the U.S., I think they're going to have a really difficult time, more challenges for the future. All right. Thank you. Okay. With that, I, I think it's time to close. I thank you uh, both very much for uh, stimulating discussion and, and uh, excellent exchange of uh, insightful views uh, for this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John, and all the speakers for delivering stimulating and insightful session. Now, this marks the end of the ALC webinar. And as we have mentioned earlier, due to concerns of COVID-19, uh, we have decided to postpone the 11th ALC until November. Therefore, starting from this month, we will continue to prepare webinars with influential speakers around the world. Again, thank you everyone for your participation and we hope to see you again. And thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>